Bienvenidos, bienvenidas. Antes de comenzar... Antes de comenzar, me sugieren desde eh, la Secretaría que la persona Miriam Teresa Rodríguez, si está por acá, que pase por ahí, seguramente para resolver un asunto de su interés, como se suele decir en estos casos. Buenas tardes, doncs, donem inici a la sesión de trabajo, a la tercera conferencia del Congrés. Buenas tardes, damos inicio a la sesión de trabajo con la tercera conferencia del Congreso. La impartirá el profesor Charles Jennings. Bienvenido. Charles es director de Dunson Associates y uno de los pensadores más importantes y reconocidos en el área del aprendizaje y desarrollo. Especialmente en el aprendizaje informal y en el puesto de trabajo. Precisamente trabaja y ha trabajado sobre gestión del cambio y la mejora del rendimiento en las organizaciones. Se le considera una autoridad en el ámbito del aprendizaje organizacional y en estudios de enfoque innovador respecto a la capacidad de creación de mano de obra. Tiene importantes y reconocidas aportaciones sobre estos temas y más particularmente utilizando el marco 70-20-10 para el aprendizaje organizacional, del que ustedes sin duda habrán oído hablar. A lo largo de su carrera ha desempeñado roles directivos en organizaciones diversas, como por ejemplo el Centro Nacional para el Desarrollo del Aprendizaje Basado en Redes en el Reino Unido. También ha desempeñado y desempeña tareas académicas, especial mención a la que lleva a cabo, llevó a cabo en Southampton Business School. Desempeñó tareas y sigue haciéndolo de evaluación de rendimiento formativo, reclamado por instancias, corporaciones diversas, entre ellas encargos de la Comisión Europea. También forma parte de grupos de dirección y consejos asesores nacionales e internacionales. Es notoria su profusa actividad en este campo, siempre centrando en temáticas que tienen que ver con la formación, el aprendizaje en ese tipo de órganos en todo el mundo. El profesor Jenkins ha escrito gran número de textos de aportaciones de índole académica, de divulgación, artículos, libros, presentaciones, entre ellas, y por no alargarme demasiado, The Working Smarts and Field Book de 2010, con Cross, Hart, Judge y Quinn. El título de su conferencia es, el título de la seva conferencia es La presentación social y en el lloc de trabajo desde la óptica 70 bin deu. Creo que los que no manejan catalán se habrán dado cuenta rápidamente del significado, pero si no, lo digo también en español. El aprendizaje social y en el puesto de trabajo desde la óptica del 70-20-10. Le dejo con ustedes. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Welcome to this afternoon session. Uh, I would like to use the time I have, first of all, to challenge some thinking around learning and development and existing approaches, and then to talk in a little bit of detail around the 70-20-10 framework. Uh, in my introduction, it was mentioned that I, I currently work in, in two roles. Uh, I have a consultancy business. I work as a consultant uh, in a, an organization called Duntroon Associates, but I also work with a group of colleagues, some of whom you will know. I believe that Jay Cross addressed this conference a year or two ago. Uh, Harold Jarke, uh, from your left there, Harold Jarke, who's a Canadian, who's an expert on personal knowledge management. Uh, Clark Quinn, Dr. Clark Quinn in the center, who has expertise 
around, particularly around mobile learning, and Jane Hart, who is a, a British woman who runs the Center for Learning uh, and Performance Technologies, one of the largest resources of learning materials, certainly in the English-speaking world. Her website achieves uh, around about 200,000 hits a month, is an absolutely wonderful resource, uh, and I'll give you some details later, a wonderful resource for, for social learning. So the issue that I'd like to address first is the issue of what I call real learning. I had the, the pleasure and the opportunity to spend a day a few months ago with Charles Handy. Charles Handy is a very respected, well-known business guru. And I talking to Charles Handy about the 70-20-10 model, and to which he uh, agrees that it makes a lot of sense. But he said one thing. He said that real learning isn't what most of us grew up thinking it was. And what he meant by that was that real learning to him is really around experience plus reflection. I want to expand this a little bit, but I think that Charles Handy there captures two of the important elements uh, of, of learning. We learn through the experiences we have, and we learn through reflecting, taking time to think about those experiences and to think about what we've learned. But even before we get to thinking about the elements of real learning, I think it's worthwhile honing in, focusing in on learning itself, what we mean by learning. And to do that, I would turn to another person far more eminent than I shall ever be. But Eric Kandel won his Nobel Prize for his work on learning and memory. And Kandel defines learning in this way. Learning is the ability to acquire new ideas from experience and retain them as memories. Now what Eric Kandel was talking about in terms of retaining memory was not retaining short-term memory. He wasn't talking about learning some material, doing maybe a pre-test or a pre-assessment, going through some material and doing a post-assessment and assuming that the difference was what people had learned. He was talking about long-term memory. He was talking about memory that changes behavior. He was talking about real learning. I often tell a story. I, I did my undergraduate degree at the University of Sydney in Australia. And I went in to do an examination uh, with all my fellow, my colleagues, uh, sitting in the great hall. We were all prepared and doing our examination, and all the lights went out. This was back in the late 1960s. And all the lights went out, so the organizers of the examination asked us to put our pens down, and we waited. And they came and said, we're going to collect all the examination scripts, and we're going to rewrite the exam and ask you to sit it again at the end of the examination period in about three or four weeks' time, because this is a general power outage. The lights are not going to come on in the next hour or so, so pack up and go away. And I can clearly remember going out of the examination room and standing with some colleagues saying, this is terrible. We're going to have to learn all this stuff again because we knew that we were not going to remember it for four weeks. We'd learnt to play the game of learning for the examination with no, no idea or no thought that it was going to change our behaviour or that we were going to remember, uh, remember down the line. Uh, uh, remember that down the line. So that's the first point I'd like to make. Real learning is about changing behavior. It's not about learning stuff. And I think that if we look below the waterline, we un uncover some very interesting things about real learning. And I, I, I mentioned that I, I went to uh, university. I, I grew up in, in Australia. And uh, I took this photograph, uh, this photograph two or three years ago on the coast in Australia, and I, I thought this was a nice image about thinking about, you know, it's, these are not sharks, by the way, they're dolphins or porpoises. Uh, it's about thinking about looking below the waterline. And in fact, 
a long time, well, back in the early 1970s, late 1960s, a man called Alan Tuff, who's now retired emeritus professor from the University of Toronto, did some research looking at how adults learned. And Tuff determined that most of the learning was below the waterline. He said this, he said, we were surprised to find so much adult learning is sort of under the surface of the ocean, as it were. You just don't see it. You could forget it's there unless you keep your reminding yourself. And he published this in 1971 in, a, in a, a book called Adult Learning Project, which is available free on the web. You can download it and read it. And I had a conversation with Alan Tuff uh, probably a year ago. And he said, absolutely, we saw this 70, 20, 10 uh, model, rough uh, model, even back in the 1970s. We saw that most of the learning was occurring through what people were doing in the workplace and through talking to each other and through exchanging ideas, and that much less impact was being made by, by formal learning. So I think that uh, the metaphor of the iceberg is used a lot, but I think that this metaphor works very well because what we see in terms of learning, the formal learning, the 10% the or so above the waterline is all about courses and curricula and modules and, and formal structured learning. Learning professionals can, can manage that because it's a process that we know, we can construct the process, we can support people following the process, we can manage it. But 90% of it sits below the waterline. And one of the great challenges for people who are pedagogues, people working in learning and development, is coming to terms with the fact that they can't manage that. We can help it, we can assist it, we can facilitate it, we can support it, but we can't manage it. And so that could be anything from new experiences to observation to practice to making mistakes and learning from our mistakes to, as David was talking, uh, speaking about this morning, rich conversations, challenges, uh, successes, failures, and so on. So for me, real learning is about four things, two of which I've already mentioned. The first thing, it's around exposure to new and challenging experiences. We learn when we're put into situations where we have to think about how we're going to address new challenges. It's about practice. We all need practice if we're going to embed in long-term memory that which will change the way in which we respond to uh, in particular situations. Thirdly, it's obviously about conversations. It's about rich learning conversations. And lastly, it's about reflection. So for me, real learning is around experiences, practice, conversation, and reflection. And I often speak to uh, academics and people involved in developing formal learning and ask them to hold those four activities up to any formal learning which they are designing or they're delivering. Does that formal learning provide the opportunity for experience? Does it provide the opportunity for people to practice? Does it give plenty of space for rich conversations? And does it give the time for reflection? And if it doesn't do all of those things, we need to go back and think about, even at the 10% the needs to incorporate that apart from the 90% which, isn't, uh, which is outside of the formal. And if you think, it's, it's not rocket science. If we think, about someone who's an expert, someone who is world class, top of their game, do we think that these people are not out on the court practicing day in, day out, every day practicing, getting better, improving small mistakes, small errors? Of course they are. Whether they're a top sportsman or whether they're a top thinker, they are continually stretching themselves, continually practicing, of course. And in fact, I read just in the newspaper yesterday a very interesting statement. Uh, Neil Armstrong is notorious for not giving interviews. First man to put a foot on the moon, obviously a great deal of interest in him. <clears throat> but uh, Neil Armstrong over the years has been very reluctant to give interviews. And just yesterday, he gave an interview to the chief executive of the Certified Practicing Accountants in Australia. 
And I thought this was rather interesting. Why would Neil Armstrong be giving an interview? And the answer was that Neil Armstrong's father was an auditor. He was an accountant. And the chief executive of the Australian uh, Institute of uh, Accountants knew this and uh, managed to get a, uh, an interview with him. But the interesting thing for me was the comment that this man made having interviewed Neil Armstrong. He said, for people who are leaders or aspire to be leaders, listening to Neil Armstrong is far better than doing any education any, any educational MBA program that exists in the world today. And this is from the mouth of a man yesterday, and I think it's an absolute truth. The experience of sharing and conversing with someone like that is worth a huge amount. It's worth more than you can get through any sort of formal education. So I think the, the, the first point uh, I wanted to make was really to think about what real, to me, what real learning is. So I, I want to now step and think about where that sits when we're in a world of constant change, which we are, and it's going to continue and get faster and wilder, certainly uh, in, in the foreseeable future. Change means a lot of different things to different people. It might be change because of the increasing speed of business. It might be change because of increasing mobility of the workforce, people who are not, don't come into an office every day, people who uh, work on the move. It might be changed because we live in an always-on culture where we've made a terrible <coughs> rod for our own backs in terms of we have ubiquitous communication so we be, can be connected continually and are connected always, 724. It could be changed because there are increasing demands of work because we've taken out layers of our organizations. It could be all sorts of change. So I want to focus down on one element of change which I think is having a profound impact in lear on learning. And that is organizational change. And I see a number of things happening in terms of organizations working around the world. First of all, the organizational boundaries are softening and extending or collapsing. So the idea of organizations existing by themselves is no longer the case, or rarely the case. We talk about the value chain. We talk about the need to ensure that where our customers are incorporated into our processes, our suppliers, our resellers, our, our value chain is vital. If we, 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 none of us live on an island. None of our organizations live on an island. We're also finding, so we're finding this, this softening and this extending of organizations. We're also finding that hierarchies are flattening, that the old world where we had rigid hierarchies are starting to break down. In some cases, they've broken down entirely. In some cases, they're just starting to crumble around the edges. We're moving from a world of this, and I, I love this cartoon. I think it sums up so many organizations I've worked with over the years, where a typical company hierarchy has the sociopaths at the top, has the clueless layer in the middle, and the losers at the bottom. And uh, I don't want to uh, belittle anyone, but we're moving from a world <coughs> of rigid hierarchies to a world that's much more like this. John Husband, who I've worked with over the years, a Canadian, talks about the movement from hierarchy to hierarchy, We're moving into a fully networked world. And David Gertin spoke this morning about the, uh, uh, the, the, the Clue Train Manifesto. And uh, we hadn't spoken about this at all, but uh, you'll find that there's the Clue Train Manifesto is littered through my presentation this afternoon. David Weinberger talking about your organization is becoming hyperlinked whether you like it or not. It's bottom up, it's unstoppable. It doesn't matter what your organization says. The fact is that hyperlinks subvert hierarchy. The fact that we, the, the communication systems we all have now break down the barriers and break, break them down very rapidly. We need to think about how people develop in this new world, this new fluid world. And I say the Clue Train Manifesto, wonderful book. It's available free online. In fact, I had a look while David was was speaking this morning, I googled, it, I googled it on my iPhone and I see that it's available in Spanish. Someone has translated Clue Train Manifesto into Spanish, so you can pick it off, it's free, uh, and you can read it. And the Clue Train Manifesto talked about the fact that a number of changes are occurring. First of all, work is becoming distributed. As I say, hierarchies are breaking down. Social media is having a profound effect. 
in the way in which people share information and build knowledge. And also, we're now living in a world of almost unlimited information. Yet our education systems and our learning systems were constructed for a world where information was a premium, where we, had no, we didn't have access to almost unlimited information. And it was built around a model, and it really a pre-industrial and industrial model, of being able to share scarce resources with our students or with our workers. Our workers and our students can get almost any information they care to within a blink of an eye. So we need to think about what we're doing in terms of learning and development in a very different way. So what does this actually all mean for learning? Well, it means a number of things for me. First of all, and again, I don't want to uh, denigrate or belittle what is done in learning and development, but I think that looking at today's world of learning is a little like looking at the stars in the sky. What we can see is already in the past. We look up at the night sky and we see the stars and we think that what we're looking at is there now. It's not. It was there millions of years ago. That world's passed on. So for many of us, in the past, we've been building our learning systems and providing development for our employees in an age which has passed, in, in what I would call the, the world of Frederick Winslow Taylor. Fred, Frederick Winslow Taylor wrote his book, The Principles of Scientific Management, in 1911. It was to try, he was trying to, he was attempting to systematize, build management into a, an industrial model in terms of being able to bring the management of people into an industrial system. And, and the world of, of uh, Frederick Winslow Taylor is a world of functional management. It's around managing function and process. It's around standard methods. It's around something called best practice, which once you get beyond very simple systems, best practice does not exist because there are multiple ways, good ways of doing things. There is no single way of doing things. And it's, it's a world where workers are part of the machine. And I mean, we even, in English, we use the word, word human resources, where we even think of humans as if they were like resources, other, like mon piles of money and, 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 and resources that we can use. Humans actually don't operate uh, in the same way that uh, funding and budget and other resources operate. So the past, is, I think, is a world of that. We're moving now to a, a world where speed is a criterion. Working and learning at the speed of business is absolutely critical. It's around innovation. It's around collaboration, communities. It's around workers not as part of the machine, but workers as contributors of value to the organization, whether you're working in a university or a not-for-profit enterprise or a profit enterprise or a government enterprise. Workers are contributors to the value that's being added. To put it on a, in a simple uh, diagram, I think we're moving from an old world where we stored knowledge to a new world where we need to be able to find knowledge or information when we need it. Uh, Victoria spoke yesterday around the just-in-time world. Because things change rapidly, what we learned six months ago may not be correct or may have been superseded may not be most appropriate to use today. We're moving from a world of, of learning events to a le world of continuous learning. And creating a culture of continuous learning is, is absolutely critical. And I see 70-20-10, if it's not about anything else, it's about change, a change process which can embed a culture of continuous learning. We're moving from a world of knowing to a world of doing, where we live in this ocean of information and simply knowing stuff is not enough. We've got to be able to, to do something with that information, with that knowledge. It's a world of action. We're live, moving from the world of push learning to the world of pull learning, where I pull what I need when I need it, rather than just giving, giving it to me just in case. So it's a world of just in time rather than just in case. Uh, for, we're moving to a much more personalized world 
which we've never been able to do previously, where we can provide personalized experiences which help develop individuals in a way which was really not available in the way that the reason the curriculum was developed by the Prussians in the 18th century was simply to systematize and ensure that education was made, was made available to a wide group of people. We've, we've living beyond the world of the curriculum from that point of view. And it's moving, as uh, again Victoria talked about an IBM study, of a world moving from a world where work was sep learning was separate to work to through a world where learning was enabling work to a world where learning is embedded in work and work and learning are together. And in fact, that, that IBM study showed that the value that was created is much higher where, world, where the world of work and learning uh, live together. So from my experience of working for 40 years now, more than 40 years in education, both as a university professor and, and in uh, enterprises, is that structured event-based learning is sometimes needed, but is actually not adequate, is inadequate for a world of continuing cha continuous change. And I'd just like to pick up one point around why it is. I think we're leaving this golden age of formal learning, <coughs> excuse me, where, where work and learning live separate. And we're moving to a world of what my colleagues and I in the Internet Time Alliance talk, call workscapes, where learning and work are carried out together. It's a new world. And we need to think about the models and the approaches we use in which we can operate effectively in this new world. So moving from the, the golden age of formal learning into the age of workscapes. I just want to do a slight jump to the side, because I think there's one other big change occurring which we need to think about as we're building our frameworks and our models for effective continuous learning. And I've mentioned it and it's been mentioned uh, again this morning. We're moving from a world of content to a world of context. And that I quite like this little diagram or this little, this little photograph. Any one of us looking at this, we might make some sense out of it but we won't have made this sense out of it. If you look here, there it is there, okay? If you don't have the context, you don't get the big picture. You can't see exactly what's happening. And unfortunately, context is absolutely critical and we've lost, I think, along the way. We've, education and learning has a few blind spots. And I'd just like to talk about one blind spot. The first, the first fact is, as humans, we forget. And we forget a lot, and we forget quickly. And we've known this for at least 126 years. Dr. Hermann Ebbinghaus did his research work in Berlin in 1885, and he developed, or his research showed what is now known as the Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. What Dr. Ebbinghaus showed was that without context, any one of us will forget about half of what we've tried to learn within one hour. If we don't have a contextual framework to put, to put it into, and we don't have the opportunity to use it. In other words, if we don't have the opportunity, we don't have context, we don't have the opportunity to practice. This is Ebbinghaus's, uh, Ebbinghaus's uh, data, in fact, and shows that <coughs> not only do we forget about 50% with one hour, but it's an exponential loss. We lose more and more. And in fact, Ebbinghaus, excuse me, <coughs> Ebbinghaus's research has been redone and validated over and over and over again. I'd just like to talk about a little bit of research that Harold Stolovich and Erika Keeps did seven years ago in the States. They were looking at uh, what happened in terms of performance improvement and knowledge acquisition with people who attended classroom-based courses. Their expectation was that people would go to the course, they would learn things, they would come away from the course, they would put those into practice, and their performance would improve to the, the desired state. What they found, in fact, was this. 
let me let me explain very quickly. Uh, this this one here, people join the course, and anyone uh, any of you who are uh, play tennis or golf or any sport would understand this golf golf pro or any of you who've learned to touch type would understand this dip. Your construct is broken. You, you're, the way in which you are doing things is broken down by, if you, you're a tennis player or a golfer, you go to a professional, they change your grip or they change something, and you find that your performance actually drops. Then, with practice, you build it up again. The same way as if you're a very good two-finger two typist, three-finger typist, you learn to touch type, your words per minute rate drops, it builds up with practice. So this is the first dip they found. But more importantly was this one here, where people leave the class, they go back to the workplace, they try to put what they've learned into action, they can't quite remember what they've learned, they've got no support. What happens, in fact their performance drops, so-called post-class readjustment, I try to apply what I've learned, I can't remember exactly, I have no support, so finally I go back to doing what I was doing before. Now, I, I questioned Harold Stolovitz on this, and I asked him what the time gap was between here and the start of the drop-off. I won't ask you to guess what the figure was, I'll tell you what the figure was. The shortest time they found was nine hours. So people go to the course, they come home, they have their dinner, they go to bed, they go back in the morning in the workplace, it's gone. Not always, but there's a good chance. So uh, the only thing that they found, and there's a, a, a good end to this sad story, the only thing they found was that there were two things that made a change. One was the opportunity to practice almost as soon as the course was completed, and the second was having support. And the best person to support in, a, in an organizational context was the first level manager. So manager support and the opportunity to practice can lead to a positive outcome. Uh, Mary Broad and her colleagues way, way back have done some work to show the importance of managers in learning, and it can't be stressed enough that the manager holds the key, and in fact in the 70-20-10 framework, you cannot implement a 70-20-10 framework without engaging managers. It's just not possible. So as I say, the, the, the challenge is no longer about learning stuff. It's really about the death of what I would call content-centric learning. It's about having the right tools in order to find the right stuff when we, we need it. And again, I think it ties together in terms of uh, Victoria's uh, presentation yesterday and David's this morning. Uh, we're, we're all obviously drawing or drinking from the same fountain. John Seely Brown talks about the fact that we're moving from stocks of knowledge to flows of knowledge. We need to stop thinking of knowledge resources as being stocks or stores, and we need to think about it being almost like a river that's continually changing. And we need to be able to dip into the river and get what we need when we need it. The last point I'd like to make around this change that's needed around trying to store information is some research which has been carried out by Bob Keeley, Robert Keeley and his colleagues at Carnegie Mellon University. They carried out a longitudinal study asking this question. A very large study, in fact, some 14,000 people were involved in this study. They asked them, and they were all knowledge workers. They asked them this. They asked, what percentage of knowledge do you need to do your job is stored in your own mind? Now, when they first carried this out, <coughs> back in 1986, the response was, people said, around about three quarters, around about 75%. So to do my job, I need to know about 75% of that job. When they re-ran the study in uh, 1997, so 11 years later, that figure had dramatically dropped to around about 20%, 15 to 20%. Now, two things had happened in that period of time. First of all, there was uh, obviously uh, uh, there was a rise of databases. So databases got embedded. So large amounts of information. We were dealing with much more information, and we had database technology, so people could find information more easily, even though there was increasing amounts of, of database 
uh, of, of information. And secondarily, of course, Tim Berners-Lee and Robert Cayeur had developed the World Wide Web, which again gave us tools in order to find information much more easily. So it's quite understandable why that drop was so great. When this study was redone again in 2006, the figure was round about 10%. So knowledge workers felt then that they needed to hold about 10%. So that's a significant change. And if we think of it in terms of what are the implications for learning and development, there are huge implications. Because, again, you know, we don't need to think about transferring information and building knowledge so much as helping people with core capabilities around critical thinking, creative thinking, analytical skills, all those sorts of core capabilities in terms of how to use, to find, and also find skills. Are absolutely critical. So out of this we're seeing the rise and rise of experiential learning. We're seeing a move from content to context. We're seeing a move from know what to know how. We're seeing a move from what we provide people being just a whole pile of content wrapped up in a curriculum, wrapped up in a program, to thinking about how we can provide the core capability, the core information they need, and then provide them with the opportunity to practice, to uh, have rich experiences, uh, conversations, and reflection. And it's around how learning. It's around focusing on the how rather than the, the what. So to help people understand and work in this total new environment, what we need is uh, we need a framework. We need a framework to move from the, the curriculum <coughs> course model into the continuous model. And that's where 702010 comes in. 702010 is a framework. It's nothing more than a framework. It's based on research that tells us that 70 to 90%, or let's just say most of what workers learn they acquire informally on the job. It's linked to other work that's been done around informal learning, where my colleague Jay Cross uh, often speaks about the 80-20 rule. Victoria spoke about the 80-20 rule yesterday morning, where 80% of learning is informal, 20% is, is formal, and yet when we look at where budgets, time, resources, effort are put, it's much, we put a lot more resources, time and effort into that 20%. I think it's a little more complex than that. <clears throat> and I just, the only uh, complex, I, I guess, slide which I'd like to show this afternoon is, is this one here, uh, in that uh, we've worked on, I've worked with my colleagues in the Internet Time Alliance, we've worked on, on various models of or categorizing learning. And I think, and I hope you can see it from, from at the back there, but basically if we think about formal and informal learning, uh, I, like to, I prefer to use the terms directed, self-directed, and undirected learning rather than formal, informal. Uh, the formal, around about 10%, learning and development, as I say, can manage. It's dependent learning, it's, it's dependent upon instruction, having an instructor, external person provides that. Informal can be either self-directed or undirected, and undirected learning is, is really what I would call, I don't know how it translates into Spanish, but the word I would use is happen chance. I just happen to tumble over something and see someone doing something in a particular way, and I think, that's interesting, I'll try that. Or I make a mistake just by chance and I discover that that produces some results and I learn from that, so I learn in that way. So self-directed, undirected. Self-directed and undirected learning is either interdependent, we learn with others, through others, or we learn by ourselves with some sort of support. So there's a lot more, uh, if you want to follow up any of this, there's a lot more uh, on the websites and on, on various sites of both Harold Jarke and, and Jane Hart have written quite a lot about this. So the 70-20-10 framework is based around this sort of research that tells us that around about 70% of learning, adult learning, uh, is through experience. Around about 20% we learn with and through others, and around 10% through structured learning. That means that 90% 
is experiential and social learning and development. So if we look at it like this, experiential learning, social learning, formal learning, as I say, making 90%. It's, the framework has been developed to address some, pretty, some very core facts. First of all, we know that people learn more informally than they do formally, that novices, people who are new to a role or new to an organization, will usually require a greater proportion of formal help and support than people who are veterans, people who have been in a role or an organization for a long time. Veterans will rely much more on informal learning, and that formal learning works best where we have explicit information. So if it's a matter of, of straightforward, simple following rules, and we have rules and regulations and processes, formal learning works better. Informal works much better where we're dealing with tacit situations. And many of us, most of us in this room, will work in the latter area where we're working, where we earn our livings with our heads rather than our hands. And therefore, informal learning is much more appropriate there. It's a framework based on a series of empirical studies and survey work. And I mean by empirical, I mean observational studies. Uh, I have not, I have never come across a peer-reviewed uh, paper of research that shows that learning breaks down exactly 70, 20, 10. I don't believe I ever will because it's all contextual. But it's an extremely useful framework. It's a reference model. It's not a recipe. Apart from Alan Tuff's work, I think it probably first came to light in the mid-90s when Morgan McCall and some colleagues at the Center for Creative Leadership did some work, again, a survey, a small survey, and asked successful managers how they became successful. And the responses they got back was about 70% from tough work, from difficult roles, doing difficult jobs, about 20% from people. This was back in the mid-90s, so it was mostly the boss then, mostly their manager. I think that would be very different now. Uh, and about 10% from courses and reading. They published it in this book, or Bob Eichinger and uh, Mike Lombardo published it in this book called The Career Architect Development Planner. There's just a little bit, I, I wouldn't recommend buying the book. It's incredibly expensive. Uh, costs you some $120 now. Is a little bit about 70, 20, 10 framework, but nothing more. But it's been replicated over and over again, this research, in different ways. And here's some examples of how it has been replicated. Uh, people learn 70%. Lowenstein and Spitzer did some work for the US Bureau of Statistics uh, back in 96. They identified about 70% of work uh, was, was, was developed, of learning was, was done informally. Uh, Education Development Center in Massachusetts also came up with this figure of around about 70%. 75% here in the Capital Works study. So there's a number of studies which show that there seems to be something underneath this. There's, as I say, you won't find peer-reviewed uh, research that shows the split exactly, but there's, a clear, there's some clear work. And actually, even more recently, some, some folks I know who, a chap called Peter Casebo and his colleague uh, Owen Ferguson uh, in a, a comp work in an organization, a company in Edinburgh in Scotland, carried out a survey just uh, a couple of years ago and they asked managers uh, the five most frequently used activities in terms of learning and development. And there are no courses here. Informal chats with colleagues, having an informal discussion with your colleague, or on-the-job instruction from your manager from a colleague, or using a search engine, or just trying things out and making mistakes. They also discovered that these two here informal chats with colleagues and on-the-job on instruction were seen as being the most effective. So they weren't only the most used, frequently used, but they were also seen as being most effective. So there's data like this. You can download all the core data from, uh, from this study. They've made all the, all the core research data as available. So we're seeing this, this change uh, that 70-20-10 is fitting into. And the 70-20 there's increasing evidence of the power of this 70 and 20. And this, for example, uh, Josh Burson, Burson & Associates, just in March this year, released a report 
that showed that organizations with strong informal learning capabilities, including social learning, so talking about both experiential and social learning, are 300% more likely to excel at global talent development than organizations that, without those competencies. So we're starting to see reports and research and surveys coming out which seem to support very strongly the fact that those organizations that focus on developing their people through experiential and social learning will outperform others. I just want to make a point about informal, because I, I mentioned that I don't like the term informal learning. Uh, it's not haphazard or random. Informal learning is not haphazard or random. And it's, neither, it's not either or. In other words, we don't learn either informally or formally. We learn through a mix. For example, learning mathematics is mostly formal, because mathematics we need to build our understanding on uh, on prior knowledge, we need, to we need to understand the concepts, have lots of practice, move to the next concept. Uh, so it's mostly formal. Learning to ride a bicycle, for example, is mostly informal. I shouldn't imagine that any of us here, when we learn to ride a bicycle, that our parents sat us down and explained to us Newton's first law of motion, the law of inertia, you know, explained that, uh, you know, what they would have said is keep pedaling or you'll fall off and given you a push and you would have fallen off and you would get up and you'd get on and you would do it again and do it again. So learning to ride a bicycle is mostly informal learning maths and any activity we look at will tend to be a mix. So let me talk about some of the typical activities that we might put into each of these buckets, so to speak. So experiential learning can be a wide range of things. I often get asked when I'm doing work with organizations about how do we implement this. I usually sit down and, let, and talk, use this as a sort of starter for the discussion. So it might be applying new learning and skills in real situations. So the manager is important in terms of bringing any learning in and making sure that there's the opportunity to use it. It might be giving the chance to stretch to lead a new team. I often say, a very simple way is if you have a new project and you have uh, Sally here, who's a very, very good project manager. She's, won, she's managed lots of good projects. Rather than getting Sally to manage this new project, you get Tim here, who's young and enthusiastic, but has never managed a project. Get him to manage the project and ask Sally to mentor him. In other words, give him a stretch assignment. Give him a challenge, but give him support. So there's all sorts of things that can be done. Reflect and learn from different projects. In fact, again, the Corporate Leadership Council did some very interesting survey work I was involved in some years ago that showed that there were three things that managers could do which caused or well, which resulted in much improved performance over simply having the right knowledge and skills. These three things improved performance 300% over simply having the right knowledge and skills. One of those was reflecting and learning from projects. The other one, the other two, one was having challenging work, and the third one was telling people what was expected of them and explaining how they were going to be measured. Really simple stuff that good leaders and good managers do. It could be stretch assignments. It could be uh, cross-divisional, moving people around, giving people the opportunity to see different bits of your organization and work in bits of your organization. It could be coordinated swaps, secondments, same sort of thing, day-to-day -day research, encouraging people to inquire and carry out research themselves. It could be developing, it could be a range of any, almost anything you can think of. What about the typical 20 activities, those social activities, those activities involving other people, those social learning activities? Well, simple things such as ensuring that people work in teams, and making sure that they share, that they carry out rich conversations as we did this morning, that they, there's the opportunity for discussion and reflection, that people build strong networks. It's, in fact, there's research being done, Rob Cross and his colleagues at the University of Virginia, who've done a lot of work on social network analysis, have, have published quite a lot on the fact that it's who you know not what you know in an organization that gets things done. 
and people with good networks, and in fact I've used some very good tools as part of the HR operating rhythm where you can identify people's networks and use that as development objectives for people to build stronger networks. It might be informal coaching mentoring, it might be action learning, it could be a range of things. And increasingly, it's, increasingly, it's the use of social media and social technologies to help solve problems. Let me tell you a story. I was working recently with uh, a, a, a group of people in London, one of whom worked for a law firm. And we were talking about social media policy, what the organiza our organization's policy was in terms of using Facebook and Twitter and various social media. And, and she said, well, my big law, firm, law company, we don't allow, we're not allowed to use social media at all. And I said, but I've seen you on Twitter. I know that you're a Twitter user. And she said, yes, of course I use Twitter because I, it helps me solve problems. Uh, what I do is, uh, if I have a problem, I uh, take my iPhone, my smartphone, and I go into the lady's toilet, and I tweet, and I'll come back 10 or 15 minutes later, and there's every chance that I'll have a response. And so despite the fact that my organization doesn't permit me to use it, I find it's, in, it's absolutely essential for me to do my job well. So we'll see, and of course, organizations, I think, are slowly giving up the idea that they can prohibit people from using te these technologies because of smartphones and because we all have it in our pockets. And so we're seeing this rise and rise of social learning. And we're not seeing it just in, in particular organizations. We're seeing it across the board. For example, the CIA have been using wiki technology incredibly successful for a number of years. The Entelopedia is the way in which they share information and learning across the organization. I often talk about the CIA when I'm talking with banking organizations or legal organizations or pharmaceutical organizations who say, we can't possibly use this because they're in insecure. We need the security. If any organization needs security, it's the CIA. They're big users. You have companies like Pfizer who use their Pfizerpedia Again, it was totally embraced by their regulatory group because they saw the power of using this tool. Caterpillar have a knowledge work of some 3,000, greater than 3,000 active communities of practice. British Telecom rolled out something called Dare to Share. Uh, the chief learning officer of British Telecom surveyed the British Telecom engineers and 78% of the engineers, when asked, said they would prefer to learn technical information, technical knowledge. They would prefer to learn from other engineers. They would, did not prefer to learn by going and being taught in a classroom or by some trainer, lecturer, teacher. They prefer 78%. So Peter Butler, the man who was the chief learning officer of British Telecom at the time, he rolled out a system called Dare to Share, which is basically an internal YouTube and podcast system. It has been incredibly successful. Not only has it allowed British Telecom to improve the quality of its service to its customers and to learn at the speed of business, it has also taken six million pounds, so what the six point something million euros out of the cost of developing the technical people. It's been incredibly successful. I've been involved with an organization which is, uh, just let me touch on Nationwide Insurance. Nationwide Insurance, an insurance organization in the UK, is using Yammer for a sort of Twitter, and in Yammer, many of you will know, is an internal Twitter Facebook type application which can be put inside a firewall and used securely. And uh, uh, Nationwide Insurance are using it very, very powerfully and well for sharing. Let me just come back to, uh, uh, to, to British Telecom. Uh, what I've seen, happening in social and experiential learning over the last two or three years is a move towards video, using video as a very, very powerful support and development and learning tool. You know, we are very visual animals and the limitation has always been the technology. And in fact, I haven't brought it with me, but I usually carry a little tiny uh, camera which I film often interviews and when I talk to people just to capture myself. But 
British Telecom, as I say, rolled out data share. I've seen uh, uh, some examples which have been tremendous. I'd like to tell you one last story. Uh, the Dixon's retail group in the UK uh, have stores across Europe. They own a number of brands. One brand is called PC World, and they have PC World uh, stores in, in Asia, in, in continental Europe, and they own Currys and various other, other stores. It's a little like Best Buy in America. Uh, the chief learning officer at Dixon's looked at his employees in PC World who are generally young, tech-savvy people who work on the shop floors, who will sell you a computer or a printer or a bit of technology when you go in. And he looked at how they were using their learning management system and their learning. And he discovered a number of things, very interesting. He discovered, first of all, that the peak time of use of his learning management system was between 9 p.m. and midnight, with some users accessing it at 2, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. Now, I know midnight is not very late in Spain. In the UK, midnight is quite late. Uh, <laughs> and he also discovered that the device that was being most used to access his learning management system was a PlayStation. So these employees were using the equipment that they used when they went home at night to play their games on their PlayStation. They were using it to access their learning for their work as a new product was being rolled into the store. So, and, and an increasing number of accesses were being by, by a smartphone. So he looked at, th at this and thought, well, using our learning, our learning system isn't, uh, isn't appropriate. So he rolled out uh, a system uh, this one here, this is just a screen grab from, uh, from what they've done. And as you can see, it's uh, a group of videos, there's, there's communities in here, there's a library of content, there's the ability to put any sort of content you like in here. The very smart bit about this is you have a button here which says record. So if I have a webcam, I can just record something on the webcam. I don't need any software, I just record it and I can edit it on the platform and launch it, make it available to all my colleagues. Uh, I can upload, equally I can upload, uh, upload anything I like. And so what they did at Dixon's was they implemented this system and they did it in a very innovative way. They did it as a, a challenge and a competition. There was a new Toshiba, Toshiba laptop that was going to come into the stores. And so they deployed this uh, Fuse system, as it's called, they deployed this system gave everyone access to it, or gave a group of people in some stores access to it. And they said, we would like you to present, produce your best sales pitch for this new Toshiba laptop. I can tell you, I saw them. Uh, I didn't see all of them because there were 500 produced, but I saw a number of them. They were absolutely fabulous. Some of them could have been broadcast on television as advertisements. They were absolutely superb. What they found was a number of things. First was that those, oh, and you can rate uh, all the, uh, the content. Oh, you can't see the screen here, but you go in and it's got an Amazon type rating. So you rate the content, you can, leave con you can leave comments and so on. What they found was that the people who produced the content that was relate rated low simply went, simply went back and did it again and did another one. So they just went back and, and improved until their ratings by their peers were higher. Uh, the outcome of that, when they looked at the results, because the Dixon's group were not involved in doing this simply because it was, it was cute and it was tech, tech smart, they were interested to see whether it had any impact. What they found was very interesting. They found that the, the stores, the outlets that were using this rather than this approach, rather than traditionally taking people off the stores that were taking people off and training them on the new products that were being sold, they outsold, they increased the revenues by 30%. 30% higher revenues from the, st from the stores that had used this, from the salespeople that had been through this process. Subsequently, just actually, where are we? On the 1st of June, Dixon's is deploying this across their entire organization. They see this as the future way in which they're going to develop their people. So I think that 
in terms of these new approaches, and this is, as I say, video-based, although you can put any sort of content into it. Uh, the very smart bit is that uh, I was in the, in the offices of the company that produces this technology in London, and uh, one of the people invited me into an office, and he interviewed me for 10 minutes about the 70-20-10 framework. Uh, within 24 hours, he'd animated that audio into a very nice little animation and put it out on the web. The last time I looked, there'd been 15,000 views. I'm sure there's more. Some of you may have seen it. If you search for 70-20-10, it pops up uh, there. So this, these sorts of very visual and very quick, rapid approaches in terms of using new media and social approaches and social uh, technologies and tools, I think are not a passing phase. They're very much the future and the way we're going to move. I, I mentioned that uh, I would just talk a little bit about, uh, or I, I'd give some references to, uh, from the, the social learning, this 20 learning piece, to my colleague uh, Jane Hart, who runs the Center for Learning and Performance Technologies. If you look at sociallearningcenter.co.uk, you'll find a huge wealth of material around social learning, including uh, a book that's been published, a social learning handbook, plus various other work, plus 100 plus examples of the use of social media for learning and some 2,000, a list of some 2,000 tools which are used for technology tools used for learning. So not to forget the 10%, because the 10% still has a role in learning and development. There's no doubt about it. And that's, that's the work that we all know well, and many of us have been doing for years and understand how it works and how to do it, whether that's through structured programs, whether that's through activity-based workshops, whether it's through formal development, uh, through business schools or uh, e-learning or any number of different approaches, many channels now that we have that we can help people and support people through formal structured learning. So they're the 70-20-10. My experience has been with this framework, and I, I, I rolled it out globally when I was Chief Learning Officer at Reuters. We rolled it out globally between 2004 and 2007. Uh, it's still running. And what I've noticed in the work that I do with organizations is it's not limited to any particular industry. It's not limited to just commercial organizations. If you look at these uh, logos here of organizations, this is, this is not a, an absolute list. There are many organizations using the model which are not here. But if you look here, you'll see that there are banks, there are consultancy companies, there are universities, there are government departments, there are not-for-profit agencies. There are all sorts of organizations who are now using this framework as their framework to, for developing their employees. And I, I get emails almost every day from organizations not on this list saying, asking questions or engaging around that. So I wanted to touch just on, uh, as I, I, I finish off, I want to touch just on the role of managers. I said the man role of managers is vital. Again, I'd go back to some work carried out by the Learning and Development Roundtable, part of the uh, Corporate Leadership Council, or Co Corporate Executive Board, uh, that was carried out that showed that managers who are focused and effective at developing their people, those people will outperform others by around about 25%. In other words, if you have a good manager who is focused and effective at helping your development, you're effectively giving your organization an extra day and a bit's work every week at no cost to you, no cost to the organization, no cost to anybody. So I can't impress enough the fact that the role of managers, the role of leaders in terms of development, and particularly in the 70-20-10 approach, in other words, in that 90% part, the role of leaders is absolutely critical. And a lot of my time is spent now working with organizations and in fact often presenting to their leadership to explain why their roles are so important, why they need to be involved, engaged, and model and support the behaviors that we're expecting to see in terms of development. So just finishing off in terms of 
what this means for learning and development. Well, there's some big challenges here because we're talking about moving from event-based learning to continuous learning. It's more complex. It's much more difficult to manage. It requires manager engagement, as I said. We can't do it in a box and send people out again, take them into a box and send them out again. It requires very different skills of learning and development professionals, very different skills. It requires consultancy skills. It requires real under deep understanding of adult learning. It requires technology skills. It requires all sorts of skills which may not be required in, in our previous uh, event-based learning model. It requires uh, new learning design. We're not designing a series of events. We're, we're designing a set of resources. I'm starting to see new roles emerge now. I, I had someone in a workshop I was running in Australia last month whose title was the content curator. So his job was taking content, making sense of it, filtering it out, and making it available to his organization, a very large organization. So we're starting to see community manager roles appear where people, uh, learning and development people, are moving away from designing, developing, and delivering learning experiences to simply managing communities. So it fundamentally changes the role. The 70-20-10 framework fundamentally cha changes the role. It moves from, uh, just to pick up a few points, it means that the trad traditional HR and learning and development role is moving from one where we build and maintain catalogs of courses, curriculum, programs to, to managing workscapes, to thinking about how we can help people do their jobs better, whatever tools we use, whatever approaches we use. It's around moving from designing and developing to focusing on supporting, curating, and ensuring people have the right stuff to do the job at the right time. It's moving from a, a, what I'd call a course-centric to a performance-centric role stopping thinking about the process and th start thinking about the, the outputs. It's, it's around moving from learning to performance and productivity in whatever area you are. So it requires a very, very different mindset. My experience in working with learning groups is that some learning and development professional, pre professionals grasp it and, and are superb. Others take a little time. Others never, ever make it. So it really is a change in, in the profession. So I just finish with uh, a statement, because I think that in an information-rich, ever-changing world, continuous learning is actually the only sustainable advantage that any organization has. If we can't build a culture of continuous learning, we will fail. Our organizations ultimately must fail, without a doubt. So, Having st sat and spoken for a long time, uh, I'd like to hand over to you for your thoughts, your questions, which I can take now and over coffee. Uh, thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Buenas tardes nuevamente. Muchísimas gracias, Professor Jennings por su eh, atractiva y eh, motivadora propuesta que nos ha tenido, al menos a mí y aquí en primera fila, absolutamente encandilado. Seguramente porque se vinculaba con muchos de mis intereses y mis campos objeto de estudio. Es el momento de eh, abrir, y lo hacemos, un turno de palabras, de intervenciones de ustedes, dirigidas hacia la mesa, hacia el profesor. Pueden ser preguntas, observaciones... Eh, alguna reflexión se sugiere que si van a intervenir pues pidan la palabra las personas, nuestros compañeros les proporcionarían el, el, micro, el micrófono y al iniciar su breve breve discurso eh, deberían presentarse diciendo pues quiénes son y tal vez de dónde vienen recogeríamos preguntas eh, des y después daríamos la palabra al profesor para que pues haga sus, sus aportaciones si les parece Por lo tanto, en la medida que ustedes lo reclamen, vamos dando palabra. Bueno, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Ignacio Alcalde, soy consultor multimedia. Y mi pregunta va 
Usted ha hablado sobre el, el aprendizaje social, pero para el aprendizaje social no cree que deberíamos eh, establecer redes de confianza, o sea, personas con criterio que realmente nos filtren un poquito. Uno por uno, entonces. I, I think that that's 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 a very good. Uh, uh, very good question. Trust is extremely important. I think there are, there are, uh, there's trust and trust. I think, uh, let, me co let me come back. I think trust is important, but I don't necessarily think that we as learning professionals need to stand in the way of people learning and filtering themselves. I always find it interesting that we employ, you know, we, we put people through quite a complex process in terms of when we recruit them and hire them. And then often organizations, as soon as people join the organization, we cease to trust them. So, you know, we hire people and we think we hire the best people and then we we say we don't trust you because everything has got to be filtered through our organization. And I, I can never understand this. I often want to go to the recruiting, the people who work in HR in recruiting, and say, why are you hiring all these untrustworthy people? I think that trust is an important element. But I, I, I'm not suggesting that, uh, that learning and development doesn't have a role in, in terms of producing content and helping distill information and making it easy, easily accessible and doing all that, that's extremely important. But I think that we need to move away from the idea that we must control it, that people don't know what's best for them. I mean, we are, most people that we hire into our organization are adults, and we need to think of them as adults. We need to be able to help them and support them. And it comes back to what I was saying in terms of, certainly there are certain times when we need to manage learning but most of the time we shouldn't be trying to manage it. And in fact, one of the questions I'm asked all the time is, two, well, two questions, is how do we, when we talk about informal workplace and social learning, first is how do we manage it, and second, how do we measure it? To the first question I say, how do we manage it, that is the wrong question. It's not how do we manage it, it's how we support it, how we facilitate it, how we help it happen. The second question, how we measure it, my answer is we measure it in exactly the same way we should have been measuring formal learning for years. We look at what the expected behaviors are, how we expect people to perform, what our expectations are, and is the process, the support we're giving, is that achieving those outcomes? As I said at the outset, giving people a pre-test, a post-test, and a ticking in the box, assuming that learning has occurred, that's a misconception. No learning has necessarily occurred. My colleagues and I, when the lights went out at the university, we, ha we, were, we were not challenged because we'd learnt, learnt things. We had committed a lot of things to short-term memory, which we were going to forget within the next few days. So I think that you know, it comes back to, to that. So I'm not, I'm not suggesting that the role of learning and development is not around producing distilling content. There is certainly a role there, but it's not all about that. Muchas gracias. Hola, buenas tardes. Me llamo Pedro, eh, soy director de una pequeña institución educativa y soy padre de un niño bastante pequeño, un bebé. Desde estos tres roles, como decía Serafín, he estado ensimismado en su charla y desde esos tres roles se me abren un montón de preocupaciones, o algunas, que son las que quería exponer y hacer alguna pregunta concreta. Uh, como director sé positivamente por algunas dinámicas que llevamos en mi centro que algunas de sus recetas, entre comillas, son altamente eficaces. Especialmente el darle la, la iniciativa, a, 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 en este caso, a los profesores, a mis subordinados, digamos. ¿no? Esto ha creado un clima increíble en la escuela, de horas, de trabajo extra, de creación de nuevas líneas de liderazgo que no esperaba. Pero claro, pertenezco a una institución cerrada a lo que es una escuela. Mi preocupación hasta ahora acercándome ya a, esta, a estos nuevos planteamientos, era cómo integrar lo informal en lo formal, que es el encargo social que tenemos las escuelas. Somos específicamente formales. Y el último rol me lleva a la última pregunta, el de ser padre. Como muchos padres me empiezo a plantear, y mi compañero me empieza a plantear, 
si yo debo mandar a mi niño a una escuela al uso o a ninguna escuela. Okay. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, I think the, uh, well, the, the question you raise is, is an interesting one. I, I've seen organizations embed the 70-20-10 framework within a formal construct. So I, I usually refer to it either as evolutionary or revolutionary. Revolutionary is taking a step back and saying the way that we did things before, which was primarily formal, we're going to tear that down and we're going to rebuild it so that we incorporate the 70, exploit the 20, and use the best of the 10. So that's, a, that's what I'd call a revolutionary model. That's what I did at, at Reuters. The chief executive said to me, we're spending, 80, we're spending 100, almost 100 million uh, euros a year on developing our people. I went in, he said, you have, you have the authority to change whatever you like. So that was wonderful for me. Uh, so that was a revolutionary approach where we took everything apart and rebuilt. The, the evolutionary approach, and I've seen it work very effectively, is where people have taken the formal construct, the formal approaches that they're using, and they've deconstructed them, taken them apart, but put them back in. So rather than, than spending uh, all the time in terms of didactic teaching, we say, how can we, how can we incorporate the opportunities for experience? How can we give our students the chance to try things out, to make mistakes? How can we build in social elements? How can we use conversation and, and various working in teams in terms of supporting, uh, supporting the learning? And how can we wrap that up into our formal curriculum, it may be? How can we make sure that we start to defocus on the didactic teaching and start to focus on the learning approach. So I think that there's, you know, there is, it depends on the context, but there are opportunities. I've never worked with an organization where I haven't seen opportunities to move some way towards the 70-20-10 framework, in other words, some way towards utilizing experiential and social learning. And in fact, I, I don't know what age uh, of the, of the, that your students are, but I've seen it in very young children where it's actually very easy to do it because that's a lot of how the, the approach is anyway. Further up into university education, it becomes more difficult. But uh, again, I've seen uh, universities adopting this and, and working well. So I think what you know, I would say to you is think about it as an evolutionary approach. What can you do just to, to make it, rather than turn everything up and, and start again, to make it change, a little, change things a little? Muchas gracias. ¿Alguna otra intervención? Tenemos ahora el espacio y la oportunidad para, para expresarnos. Aprovechemos el conocimiento disponible de las personas de la sala y tal vez se pueda compartir. Parece que no. Yo tengo alguna observación para el profesor. Bueno, más que una observación es una reflexión que de alguna manera eh, con su plática pues me ha ayudado a, a, a resolver Claro, estamos hablando de la importancia del aprendizaje informal basado en la experiencia, con cambios o no en esos porcentajes, 70, 20, 10, decimos que prevalece el aprendizaje que se adquiere en el puesto de trabajo, en espacios y escenarios informales. Y ahí hay un asunto que usted ha tratado en los últimos momentos, es el papel de los directivos en este, digamos, nuevo escenario, que supone admitir, aceptar, promover tal vez cambios culturales en la organización, porque pasamos de regulación a desregulación, formalización a emergencia, estandarización a docracia, estructura formal, cierta estructura informal que convive con la formal, disposición de espacios físicos para promover esos encuentros, hay que hacer algo en la organización en términos, digamos, de... De, de, de entorno físico incluso replantearse políticas de formación permanente eso supone inversiones económicas ¿qué nos puede ayudar desde su perspectiva? My experience is that you only engender change if you work top down and bottom up at the same time 
So uh, there's no point someone who's responsible for learning or training in an organization coming with great ideas to try and make changes. You have to work at the top as well. So you need to find sponsors, champions, senior leaders who understand uh, the benefits, the potential benefits in terms of making these changes and work with them. I was very fortunate when I, when I worked at Reuters, the chief executive, Tom Gloser, really understood it. He understood exactly where, where I was coming from. He gave me the opportunity to spend lots of time with senior leaders across the organization, talking to them, talking and showing them data, for example, data in terms of the impact that managers who are focused and effective at developing their people. Uh, I mean, you, you can't really argue against this data. And so it was very much a change and a culture change process. So it doesn't happen immediately. It's not like switching on a light. It takes time. It needs persistence. It needs a lot of courage sometimes because it's asking, it's requesting, well, it's requiring managers to focus on developing their people and to do more work in some cases. And uh, it needs support and it needs often challenging discussions in order to do it. Uh, but it's a journey. And uh, from my experience, I have not worked with any one organization that's implemented this framework that have not found, firstly, that it's lowered the cost. I think Victoria was saying yesterday that you know we shouldn't look at this uh, informal learning in terms of a way to, to make it cheap. I absolutely agree. I would never lead by saying this is going to be cheaper, but I've never ever seen a situation where an organization has implemented the 70-20-10 framework and the cost of developing people ha has gone up. It's always gone down. So I think that uh, there's some very powerful arguments. And I have used those arguments occasionally with a chief financial officer. I've said, look, here's some figures. If you want a, a good financial argument, here it is. But I would never lead with that. Uh, so I think it's a journey, and it's, uh, it, it has to be looked at strategically. We have to take a step back and look at what our structures, what structures we have in place, how, how we're organized. We have to look at the governance, how we manage development of our people. We have to rethink. Uh, our methodologies, we have to rethink how we do things, our capabilities, we have to go through that process. It's, it's like any other change process. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. Uh, I've, again, not seen any or work with any organization that hasn't found it incredibly fulfilling. L&D, learning and development people, have always find it fulfilling, even though sometimes they go home and can't sleep at night because it's very challenging. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. ¿Alguna otra intervención por parte de ustedes? Allí, por favor, cuarta fila hacia el centro, la compañera. Hola, buenas tardes. Me llamo Fe, soy educadora, trabajo en un centro penitenciario y le estoy dando vuelta a la cabeza en, eh, sobre la, el aprendizaje informal hacia los internos. Es decir, nosotros eh, tenemos una estructura muy formal muy estructurada de cómo tenemos que reinsertar a los internos. Eh, desde la educación social, pues intentamos, bueno, al menos eh, en, desde la animación sociocultural, que es lo que más yo trabajo, intentamos de alguna manera eh, darles una, una, como un, cam, un nuevo camino para, para salir a la sociedad eh, de una manera más informal. ¿no? Yo me pregunto, o, o le, o le traspaso esta pregunta, ¿hay algún estudio o usted tiene alguna idea o, o cree, cómo cree que podríamos nosotros um, trabajar esa parte de aprendizaje informal hacia ellos o qué elementos o, o qué recursos podríamos tener para aplicarlos a ese trabajo de la reinserción social? Gracias. Es un muy interesante contexto en términos de cómo piensas sobre uh, educating people in such a, a regulated and controlled environment, I think. Uh, certainly, I, I have a little bit of experience from of using these sorts of systems in the prison system. I, I did some work uh, with prisons but some years ago, uh, which was using internal networks to help sharing, but controlled and contained networks, so obviously not, not external networks and so on, but using internal networks and so on. I certainly see lots of opportunities for social 
for social learning and, and through uh, embedding, and I'm sure you, you already do a lot of this experiential learning and developing uh, uh, through, through work and through experience. Uh, I certainly think so. Obviously, there are constraints, and it's a, it's a very good example. I'd like to talk to you afterwards around the p possible opportunities in, in that area. But uh, I would say that uh, my experience is I, I have not come across any uh, organization, whether it be in a highly regulated environment, such as one you're, you're speaking of, whether it be in a medical environment or a financial environment or a pharmaceutical environment or whatever, that where there haven't been opportunities for encouraging and supporting informal learning. I, again, you know, coming back to what I, I was talking earlier around what real learning is, it's about behavior change and in your situation you are trying to embed very different behaviors and persistent behaviors that are going to last and I think there are real opportunities for working in that 70 and 20 area uh, in order to do that. Muchas gracias. Jesús, por favor, aquí en primera fila. Sí, me parece que se oye. Sí, sí, sí. Bueno, yo aprovecho eh, una pregunta que de una educadora social. Este entorno del Departamento de Justicia, donde hacemos el Congreso, pues si no lo sabéis, micro, está micro, ubicado en el Departamento de Justicia, donde hay mucha intervención educativa sobre población eh, reclusa en centros penitenciarios. Por eso tenemos aquí muchos profesionales que trabajan en este contexto. Es decir, somos responsables de formación muchos, pero hay muchos que están trabajando en un contexto de privación de libertad. La pregunta que hacía aquí una educadora social cuando hablaba, ¿podemos establecer eh, aprendizaje informal con la población, esta población, aquí en Cataluña estamos hablando de más de 10.000 personas. A mí se me ocurre una cosa y es en defensa del trabajo de los educadores sociales. Yo empecé hace 28 años haciendo educación social con internos y es una huella, después hemos derivado, que me, que me alargó, me, me, me llegó mucho. Y por una razón muy sencilla y tiene que ver con todo esto que explicamos de aprendizaje informal. Se decía antes, antes de que empezaran a trabajar personas como la que ha hablado, la compañera que ha hablado, donde realmente aprenden los internos es en la prisión. La, la universidad del crimen está en la prisión. Aprenden a robar, aprenden a atracar. Los mejores consejos para hacer mejores eh, eh, crímenes pues están allí en el patio. Entonces los veíamos, llegábamos allí en el patio y veías cómo los internos se comunicaban, daban vueltas cuando veían a los, a los funcionarios de vigilancia, se volvían cuando nos veían a los educadores, ponían así cara, decía esto los vamos a engañar que son más débiles o son más fáciles de engañar. Bien, era un juego de informabilidad pura y dura. ¿Qué es lo que pasó con el tiempo? Que vinieron personas como Marifé o como eh, todas las personas que están aquí y con su manera de entender la animación sociocultural, que ahora no se lleva mucho esa palabra, con la, toda la metodología de los educadores sociales, habéis influido para que el aprendizaje informal del crimen, por decirlo de esta manera, lo que se aprendía en los patios, eso se fuera sustituyendo progresivamente por hacer entornos culturales donde la radio, eh, la cerámica, eh, las... Eh, eh, Todas las propuestas educativas estaban invadidas y de pronto, yo solo he vivido como eh, eh, profesional que he trabajado allí, luego como jefe de servicio de rehabilitación, los internos cada vez tenían, siguen teniéndolo, pero cada vez tenían menos espacios para eh, compartir sus malas experiencias. ¿Qué quiere decir? Que les habéis comido el terreno. Yo quiero reivindicar el trabajo duro de los maestros, de los, de los educadores, de los psicólogos, de los juristas. Le habéis comido el terreno sin que ellos se den cuenta. Con lo cual, se ha sustituido el aprendizaje informal de, de las prácticas del crimen por aprender a, 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 a estar en, en, en habilidades sociales, aprender a estar en la escuela, aprender de las mejores experiencias que establecemos en los talleres, etcétera. Y eso es una realidad. Hoy Cataluña pasa, y yo aquí hago un poco de publicidad, pasa por tener uno de los sistemas penitenciarios más avanzados, que es modelo para otros países europeos y, y de fuera. ¿Con eso qué quiere decir? que reivindicando entre nosotros, y ya lo hacéis, el aprendizaje informal entre profesionales y haciendo buenas prácticas educativas, con eso estáis llegando a cambiar el ambiente ese nocivo, eh, cerrado que tenían los internos. Eso es, es una realidad gracias a vosotros. Muchas gracias. ¿Algún comentario, profesor? 
No, I think that's a very good exposition of what you're doing, and, and I, I'm impressed. And I absolutely agree that you know there are big opportunities to uh, to use social approaches to replace the normal social activities that go on in prisons in terms of to you know, refresh and, and change them to positive to, for positive outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah. Bien, si no hay ya ninguna intervención más, yo creo que después de darle un aplauso al profesor, les daría algunas instrucciones de orden interno. Gracias. Gracias.